Thank you, Mike, and thank you all for coming. Uh, we spent a lot of time organizing this conference, and it takes a lot of effort, so it's really rewarding to see all of you guys come out here. It's the best part. Um, so I'm going to be talking about molecular biology and the way that this new field of science has informed our understanding of the theory of evolution and also how that applies to God and the God question. But just to make things clear, my talk is going to be about 75% really hardcore, solid, good science and about 25% really lowbrow humor, internet memes, <laughs> mockery of religion. So just so you know what you're in for. So I wanted to start by talking about a few of the different um, lines of evidence that we think about when, uh, when, when we're understanding the theory of evolution. And one of the main ones is paleontology, which is, of course, you know, the study of prehist prehistoric life on Earth within the fossil record. And when you look at the fossil record, you see some pretty interesting things. Um, for example, if you look at different rock strata from anywhere in the world, um, you can see that there's different layers. And these layers tend to be very, uh, pretty well defined, and they exist everywhere around the world. doesn't really matter where you dig. And the interesting thing is as you dig deeper, you get uh, further and further away from animals that you would recognize today. So the younger layers at the top of the fossil record are more similar to things that are alive today. Things at the bottom look less and less like anything you would be familiar with. Um, and the really interesting thing is that you never seem to find fossils that appear in the wrong strata. So the biologist J.B.S. Haldane, uh, he famously said that if we ever found an example of a rabbit fossil in the Precambrian rock structures, we would pretty much have to throw evolution out of the window because we simply wouldn't be able to explain that. And as it turns out, we never see any examples anywhere of fossils turning up in layers where they shouldn't be. So, for example, humans, you'll never find humanid fossils anywhere in the Jurassic or Triassic area. So, Flintstones, not a documentary. <laughs> Another piece of evidence that is very uh, instructive of evolution is bioge uh, biogeography. So, what we mean by that is that if you look at different places around the Earth, um, you'll see that the species there tend to be grouped according to geography. So Australia is really the only place that you're going to find marsupials, for example. And you're only going to find giraffes and zebras and lions in Africa. So even though you have different regions that could exist along the same latitude or longitude lines, um, and even though, even though they might have the same environments, you see different species there. So uh, in Darwin's time, the, the only explanation for that was that God could have just arbitrarily chosen where to put all of these species. Um, but Darwin made some interesting observations which led him to a different idea. So when he was in South, Af uh, South America on his journey, he would notice things like fossils of giant sloths. And these fossils were of species that no longer exist. So that alone made him think about how uh, you know, species on Earth, they're not set in stone, or well, they're not unchanging. <laughs> they are set in stone. <laughs> and uh, you see fossils in, uh, in, like in South America. And those fossils are similar to the species that are currently existing there today. So there used to be giant sloths. Now there are normal-sized sloths. And that idea, the uh, clustering in time and space of fossils, um, that really uh, convinced Darwin uh, of that uh, species are changing gradually over time. And uh, Darwin also thought a lot about how geographical barriers can have a, a play a role in evolution. And a good example of that is famously Darwin's finches, which uh, uh, you know, evolved from a common ancestor finch and branched off into different species based on the food sources that were available on different islands. 
A third good example for evolution is comparative anatomy. So when you look at a cat and a dolphin, a human and a bat, um, on the outside surface, these animals really don't look like they have a lot in common. Uh, they don't seem very similar, on the outside at least. But when you look at their bone structures, you notice uh, that they all have the same number of bones in the same arrangement. So the humerus of a human, which is this part of your arm, uh, that bone also exists in cats and whales and bats. And same thing with the phalanges. Uh, the sizes of the bones are different, but they're always in the same number and always in the same arrangements. And that is a very uh, suggestive evidence of our common ancestry. ancestry. So those are just three of the, I would think, most convincing areas of evidence for evolution. There's a lot more I didn't mention, like embryology and other things. But uh, today, we know a lot more that Darwin had no idea about. So the fields of molecular and cellular biology and genetics, these things just didn't exist at all during Darwin's time. No one was really sure how traits were passed on from one generation to the next. They had no concept of DNA or of genes at all. Uh, Darwin was a contemporary of the Austrian monk, uh, Gregor Mendel, and he was really the first one to do experiments with genetics uh, involving pea plants. And he was a contemporary of Darwin, but uh, he, his science and his work wasn't really appreciated in that era. We only rediscovered it long after his death. So uh, Darwin really had no idea how this kind of thing worked. And uh, he actually recognized that that was a, a weakness of his theory, was he uh, didn't know how traits could be passed on in order for natural selection to work. But um, now with the advent of molecular biology, um, we now know that the theory of evolution is really absolutely undeniable, and there's no room for debate anymore. And I'm going to tell you three different stories um, about uh, how these new fields are instructing us. But first, I wanted to give you just a really brief intro into the fields of cellular and molecular biology. Those are my field, what I'm studying in my PhD program. I happen to think they're the most interesting areas of science on the planet, so you're in for a treat. Uh, <laughs> so in, the, in cellular biology, you can divide life mainly into two different kinds. Uh, there's the eukaryotes, which is uh, a human type cell, and prokaryotes. And uh, they have a few key differences that I can point out here. So you'll notice that eukaryotes have a nucleus. Prokaryotes just kind of have their DNA all jumbled up in their cytosol. Eukaryotes have a lot of structures that are missing from prokaryotes. Um, all of the membrane-bound organelles, they call them. So organelles are kind of like the organs in your body um, on a cellular level. They perform different functions. And uh, prokaryotes just completely lack all of those membrane-bound organelles. Um, but to just give you an idea of a sense of scale, the, a human cell, just your average everyday human cell, is about 20 micrometers uh, in diameter. So micro is 10 to the negative 6 meters. Um, a bacterial cell is going to be more like 2 micrometers uh, in length. So that's how much bigger uh, a single human cell is compared to a bacterial cell. But I find that people don't really have a good concept of how big uh, a, a micrometer actually is. So this humongous trunk in the back, it's about 50 or so micrometers uh, wide. And that's what a human hair looks like. So just to give you a, a better sense of scale. So what is DNA, anyway? Uh, DNA is, of course, the genetic material that we all have in all of our cells. And it's actually made up of only four letters. Uh, A's, A's, T's, G's, and C's. I don't think I did that wrong. G's and C's. Um, and uh, one, of, one of the key concepts of DNA is that A's always bind with T's and G's always bind with C's. So that, uh, that principle of complementarity is what allows a DNA strand to 
wind up with itself. Um, so the human DNA is extremely long. And um, in order to package that within your cells, you have to do a lot of uh, wrapping up of the DNA. So this is what the strand looks like up here. You, uh, you can wrap around the DNA around these proteins called histones, wrap the histones around themselves, wrap that around itself, and you just keep coiling everything up, and eventually you get to the level of a chromosome. And um, just to give you an idea of how much wrapping actually needs to happen, uh, we know that the human genome is about 3 million base pairs long, and we know that base pairs, they're about, what is it, point, <laughs> point 0.3 nanometers apart. So if you do that math, um, you get about six feet of DNA, human DNA, in every single one of your cells. Um, you might wonder um, what it would look like if you tried to print out the human genome. How much space do you think that would take up? Uh, let's say that you did it in size 4.5 font. Pretty hard to read. This is what you end up with. An entire bookshelf uh, packed with about 120 different volumes. Each volume contains about 1,000 pages. And it takes up this entire bookshelf. It's a huge thing. They actually really did print it out in England. And, uh, all of that information is contained in every single one of your cells. So in biology, we have this idea called the central dogma. And I know atheists usually don't like dogmas, but there is one that is acceptable, and that's the central dogma of biology. Um, so you have an idea of what DNA is probably pretty intuitively, um, but how does a, a how does a gene, which is made up of DNA, how does that get turned into something that's actually useful? Um, so that's what the central dogma explains. So DNA is transcribed, or they call it transcription, into RNA. Uh, RNA is very similar to DNA. It uses a slightly different sugar. But uh, for the most part, it's structurally pretty similar to DNA, except you can see it's single-stranded. So the way you can think about that is, DNA is kind of like if you go to a library and they have a bunch of reference books. So you can't check those books out and take them home yourself, but they'll let you go to the copy machine and you can make as many copies as you like. That's kind of what happens with RNA. You don't want to take the DNA, uh, your DNA genome out of the, your nucleus, but you're free to make lots of copies of RNA and shoot that out and do what you have to do with it. And in the second step, RNA is translated into proteins. So proteins, as you might know, are made up of amino acids. You are composed of 20 amino acids. So uh, your mRNA codes for different amino acids, and um, they're synthesized just like beads kind of on a string. And similarly, they will wrap up uh, amongst each other, sometimes making helices, sometimes making sheets. And they make, uh, these are the secondary structures. Here's what a tertiary structure is. You can see how the different loops and sheets fold up on each other. And they call this the quaternary structure. And that's kind of uh, what a globular protein looks like at the end of the day. So I wanted to show you a video about transcription. So remember, transcription is this first step, taking DNA and making an RNA copy of it. I'm going to try to show it on YouTube. Hopefully, this will work. OK, so you're looking at a strand of DNA. And this floppy looking thing is some of the proteins that are involved in transcription. Uh, there's an enzyme called RNA polymerase. And that's the enzyme that's responsible for making uh, copies of DNA while translating DNA into RNA. Um, and this is actually what the enzyme really looks like. These uh, animations are based on real crystal structures of what the proteins actually are doing. Um, so in a minute here, you're going to get uh, the polymerase fully assembled. There's a, a lot of different proteins that have to come together in order to make this work. Um, and once it gets going, I think you'll see it's pretty entertaining just how speedy the polymerase can be.
Here we go. Almost. <laughs> All right, and we're off. So there goes the polymerase flying around the strand of DNA and making a copy uh, into mRNA uh, extremely fast. Um, the RNA polymerase actually proceeds at about 3,000 bases per minute, uh, which comes out to 50 base pairs every single second, uh, which to me really just seems unbelievably fast, you know, too fast for you to even really C. Um, and uh, I thought it would be fun to just do a little bit of math. And I, I did some calculations where you've got about 50 trillion cells in your body. Um, and each one of those cells has about 1,000 active copies of RNA polymerase at any given time. That's probably actually a low estimate. So if you do that math, you'll see that um, at any instant, you are producing 5 times 10 to the 16th bases per second. Uh, so that's 50 petabases. Um, and that's really a number that's just too huge to comprehend. So just to give you an idea of how much data that actually is, if you took the entire contents of Wikipedia, that would be about 14 billion letters long. Um, in your body, you're doing 50 Peter bases every second. So do the math, and your body is producing the information equivalent of the entire Wikipedia about 3.5 million times every second. Uh, it's such a stupidly big number, it seems like they can't even possibly be right, but I checked my math. I'm pretty sure it is. <laughs> so let's get back to the PowerPoint. OK, so now you know that DNA has been copied into this messenger RNA molecules. But how do you get from RNA to protein, which is the final product? Uh, all, you know, all genes in your body code for proteins. That's, proteins are always the final step. And as I mentioned, proteins are made out of these 20 different amino acids. Um, you might have heard of the term essential amino acids. Those are amino acids that you, your body can't make itself, so you have to gain them. You have to eat them in your diet. So uh, in the 1950s, scientists were trying to figure out what the code could possibly be that uh, transmits the information from RNA somehow into <laughs> proteins. Um, so we know that there are four different nucleotides. Uh, by the way, in, in uh, RNA, the T is replaced with U, just so you know. Um, so there's four different nucleotides, and we can now think about uh, how the coding system could possibly work and in terms of uh, bases per word. And uh, by word, I mean the fraction of the, D of the RNA that's going to somehow code for the protein or the amino acids. So if the words were only one base long, then we could only have four possible words, you know, A, U, G, or C. But we know that there's 20 amino acids, so that can't possibly be right. We wouldn't be able to account for creating all of these amino acids. What about a two-letter word code? In that case, you could have A, 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 U, A, G, A, C, and so on. And you'd have 16 different possible uh, words. Um, so that's getting better, but you still can't get up to 20. And if the words were three bases long, then you would have 64 possible words. So that's actually more than you need. Um, and then again, if you had four per word, four bases per word, you'd be able to account for 256 different word codes. So when scientists were thinking about this, they thought that, well, they knew that one and two couldn't possibly be correct. And they thought that four was probably too many. Um, it wouldn't really make sense for biology to have um, more codes than is necessary. So they predicted that the way that the, genetic, uh, the genetic code actually worked was with having these three-letter sequences, which they call codons, uh, 
and each three-letter sequence would correspond to one amino acid. But since there's 64 different codons, there would be some redundancy in the code. And their prediction was exactly right. So this is what the genetic code actually looks like. And uh, listed here are the three-letter abbreviations for each amino acid, so valine, alanine, glycine, and all 20, and so on. And you can read the code by just using a kind of a three-axis system. So if you start with the letter A in the first letter, and then your second letter could also be A, then you have a couple different possibilities. If the third letter is A, you've got AAA. That codes for lysine. And there's a codon for every single amino acid, and also some stop and start codons, which tell the ribosome, uh, which I'll get to in a minute, tell it when to start and stop translating. And you can see that there, there is that redundancy that I talked about. So here's serine, and here's four different ways to code for serine. So that's the way that the genetic code works. And to try and picture that in action, remember translation is that last step where you go from mRNA to amino acids, and then the amino acids are the proteins. So here are the three-letter codons that I mentioned. So here's that AAA. Um, and these are molecules car called tRNAs. And they bring in an activated amino acid. And it kind of floats into this enzyme, which is a giant, spectacular enzyme called the ribosome. The ribosome is the enzyme that's responsible for synthesizing proteins. So tRNAs bring in amino acids. They uh, the, amino, the tRNAs, they have anticodons, which can base pair with the codons that are in the mRNA. And they decode the message, essentially. So this uh, UUU binds with the AAA, and it brings in that lysine amino acid. And then the amino acids get linked together chemically. Um, you have a chain of amino acids called a polypeptide. That's what proteins are. So what you've just seen in these three different steps translation, well, DNA to RNA to protein. That's the way everything works in your cell. That's the only thing DNA is doing. It's coding for proteins, and genes equal proteins in life. But one thing which I didn't mention is that the genetic code that I just showed you isn't just the genetic code for humans. That's actually the genetic code for everything. All life on Earth shares exactly the same genetic code, with a few exceptions. But for the most part, um, everything is exactly the same. So between humans and sharks and uh, E. coli bacteria, there's actually very few differences in the way that they handle their DNA, the way that they transcribe it into RNA. Um, all life on Earth uses uh, the same RNA polymerase enzymes. There's a few structural differences between us and bacteria, but the chemistry is basically the same. Uh, going from RNA to protein, everything on Earth uses ribosomes to make that happen. And everything on Earth uses the same genetic code. So I think this alone, before I've even gotten into my good arguments, uh, I think this is in itself a pretty convincing evidence for the theory of evolution. Um, if creationism is true, God could have actually chosen to do this any way he wanted. There could have been completely separate genetic codes for every species. There could be completely different genetic storage molecules. It didn't have to be DNA for everything. It didn't have to be RNA for everything. Um, proteins, like I mentioned, are made up of 20 amino acids. All life on Earth uses those 20 amino acids, but it didn't have to be that way. There could have been uh, some amino acids that bacteria use and different ones that we use. But for the most part, all life on Earth is using the exactly the same process. And evolution explains this because we think that all life on Earth ar uh, arose from a common ancestor. And if that common ancestor had invented or came up with these ways to store its genetic material, uh, it makes sense that all subsequent life on Earth would also use that same method. But Creationists can't make any kind of predictions like that. They just say, well, whatever you observe in nature, that's the way God wanted to do it. 
Um, and that just kind of shows the way that creationism is just totally incapable of coming up with any kind of scientific theories whatsoever. I wanted to take one minute just to talk about one field that I think is really interesting, and it's called synthetic biology. So what you can do in synthetic biology, for example, is you could take the human gene that codes for insulin, the insulin protein, you know, uh, deals with regulating sugar in your bloodstream. You can take out that gene and clone it into bacteria like E. coli, and then you can turn the E. coli into these little cellular factories that will pump out human insulin for you, which you can then give to humans to treat diabetes. So that's really only possible because uh, that what I just mentioned, that all life on Earth shares exactly the same mechanisms for producing proteins. Um, so I guess we can thank God for being able to do that, uh, although it's kind of ironic that a lot of religious people are opposed to this kind of research. You would think that if God didn't want us to be playing around like this, he could have given us different genetic systems, and then the human genetic carrier molecules couldn't ever be transported to, into other species? Just an idea. <laughs> so now I'm kind of in the heart of my talk, and I'm going to tell you three different stories that illustrate the way that modern understandings of molecular biology really are the nail in the coffin in ideas like creationism and intelligent design. These are stories that are really going to convince you that evolution is true. Even if you are already convinced, you're going to be super convinced after these stories. <laughs> so the first story is about one really horrible way to die. So I want you to perform this thought experiment where imagine that it's the year 1700 and you are a sailor aboard this shipping fleet. You're uh, doing some sea exploration or trading or whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, and at first everything is uh, going just fine, but after a few weeks you start to not feel so great. You start getting weak and lethargic. You have joint pain and shortness of breath. You start to see these weird changes in your skin. Um, you start to bruise really easily and the bruises just persist forever. They don't go away. Um, you've got these weird purple splotches all over your body. Uh, as it gets worse, your gums start to turn red and your teeth start to get loose and even fall out. Um, and within a few weeks of those symptoms, you die. <laughs> and everyone aboard your ship also dies eventually if you don't get back to shore fast enough. And um, this is, you've heard of this disease before. Of course, you know that other sailors have died of it. Um, but your shipmates, they, they try to do everything that they could to prevent it. So everyone who got on the ship was totally fine and healthy when they got aboard. So they weren't carrying any kind of sicknesses with them, no bacterial infections or anything like that. Um, it wasn't your food either. You made sure that that was really clean and sterile. You weren't getting food poisoning, nothing like that. And you made sure that your ship was totally spick and span before you left. Weren't any kind of rats, nothing like that. No varmin that might have gotten you sick. So does anybody have an idea of what it was that killed you? Scurvy. Yep, it was scurvy. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, the worst thing about dying this way, other than the horrible process that it goes through, is that since it was just scurvy, your life could have been saved by a lemon. All you had to do was eat a lemon and you could have survived. And in fact, if you were uh, a sailor, any time between the years of about 1500 and 1800, if you were from France or Spain or Great Britain in any of their great navies, you were actually far more likely to die of scurvy than you were of any, of any kind of combat at all. Um, eventually, the British did figure it out um, in uh, the 1700s, but there was some controversy. It wasn't really established for another couple hundred years. People discovered the cures and then forgot it because they didn't really have a good understanding of 
the way the science actually worked. But um, you've probably heard of the term limey to refer to British sailors, and that's where this comes from. Uh, eventually, when they did figure it out, they, the British Navy mandated that sailors had uh, daily lime juice rations so, to prevent scurvy. So that's where that term actually comes from. And uh, what's, what, what citrus fruits like lemons and limes have is vitamin C. So let's talk about the connection between vitamin C and scurvy. So vitamin C is actually, uh, it's used as a cofactor in a lot of different biosynthetic pathways that exist in your body. So what a cofactor is, is it's something that allows chemical reactions to take place, but it doesn't itself uh, act as a product or a reactant. So, you know, in chemistry class, you have the reactants, which are the things that you put into uh, a chemical reaction, and then out at the end, you, you have these products. Uh, the reactants are consumed. They're somehow transformed into products. But cofactors act in the middle step, so they're not actually consumed by the reaction. They just uh, help to you know, lower the activation energy of the reaction or whatever to make sure that it can actually go forward. So what vitamin C does, um, one of the things that it does is it acts as a cofactor for enzymes that are involved in collagen biosynthesis. So this is what collagen, the protein, collagen is a protein. Uh, this is what it actually looks like. It's a triple helix. And collagen is actually probably the most abundant protein in all animals. And that's because it's involved with every single kind of connective tissue that you have in your body. So that means you know blood vessels, skin, cartilage, ligaments, tendons, any kind of fibrous tissue in your body, collagen's there, keeping things together. Collagen is a really important structural protein. So it makes sense that when you have uh, a deficiency in vitamin C, you can't synthesize the collagen correctly uh, once you run out of the vitamin C. And so the collagen can't be made, and your body literally starts to fall apart because you can't make enough collagen. So this is a, I think this is a good illustrative story of kind of the way molecular biology works, where you have some large-scale phenomena that you're interested in, like scurvy, and you can go down to the protein level, figure out what's going on there, dig down deeper, and you know that it's actually enzymes that are functioning, and you can even find you know, the specific atoms and molecules that are playing a role. And uh, so that's what molecular biology is all about. It's, understanding life at its most basic fundamental levels. But uh, let's consider this situation also in a little more depth. So humans need vitamin C to survive, obviously. Uh, we can't make it ourselves, so we need to get it from the food that we eat, um, like lemons and limes and other vegetables. So if all of these fruits and vegetables have vitamin C, presumably they need it to survive also. Um, how do they get it? Well, it turns out plants can uh, make their own vitamin C. So wouldn't that be convenient if we could just make it ourselves rather than having to eat it and, uh, from food? I think if you were a sailor alive in the 1700s and you knew about this, you might rightfully be pretty angry with God for not giving you the capability of making this vitamin C for yourself. God gave us these urges to uh, go out exploring and discovering new things. So presumably God knew that we would be traveling on ships eventually. So why weren't we better prepared to go out onto the ocean like that? Maybe God never meant us to. I don't know. But if you're, if you're mad about that, you know, if you're mad about the human, the, you know, incalculable human suffering that has resulted over the, you know, thousands of years of people dying of scurvy, um, be prepared because the story actually gets much worse than that. So uh, vitamin C, it's made via a nine-step pathway. And each of these nine arrows represents a single enzyme within the pathway towards vitamin C biosynthesis. So we start out with glucose. And uh, at each step, an enzyme acts to slightly change the glucose molecule, maybe by adding a phosphate or rearranging the phosphates. Uh, 
doing a series of dif just different chemical modifications, eventually to you where you get it to step eight, where you have gluano 1,4 lactone. Who cares what it is exactly? It's just a molecule. It's the, the precursor to vitamin C. So in black, these are all enzymes and genes that humans have uh, in functional copies. We can make, we can convert glucose all the way, you know, from the beginning to gluano 1,4 lactone, the step right before vitamin C. So we're like, you know, 90% of the way there towards making our own vitamin C, but we just can't quite get all the way there. Um, so there's something wrong here in this last step where the final enzyme in the pathway, it's not working. So why did God not just give us this gene? It would have been nice if we could just finish it and get, get to the end, get to vitamin C. But it gets worse than that because we do have the enzyme. We do have the gene. It's a gene uh, called gluonolactone oxidase. So you can probably you know, barely even see the difference between these two molecules. It's just an oxidase, so it uh, gets rid of these two hydrogens here and makes this a double bond. And that's what makes gluano 1,4 lactone, the difference between that and vitamin C. So we've got the gene. Uh, it is present in the human genome, but it just doesn't work. So why doesn't the gene work? Uh, so yeah, again, this enzyme completes the final step in vitamin C biosynthesis. And by the way, almost all other animals on Earth, almost all other mammals even, can make their own vitamin C. Just not us. Why can't we make vitamin C? What is wrong with us? Well, this gluo enzyme is present as a non-functional pseudogene in humans. A pseudogene is something that looks like a gene but doesn't quite work. I'll get to that in a minute. Also, I mentioned that most other animals have this gene in a correct functional copy, but humans don't, and also primates don't. Some primates don't. So isn't that interesting that all animals can do this, but some of our most, close, uh, most closely related um, cousins in the animal world, they also can make that. Isn't, doesn't that tell you an interesting thing about how the, the way evolution works. So what do I mean when I say that it's a pseudogene? A pseudogene, it's a DNA sequence that strongly resembles a gene of known sequence. So when you look at the gene, you can tell that uh, it's actually, you can find the gene and you know that it's similar enough when you compare it to functional copies of the gene. But uh, it's a gene that has lost its protein coding ability due to the accumulation of multiple different kinds of mutations which have uh, disabled its ability to be either transcribed or translated into protein or both of those things. So a pseudogene is it's kind of like a broken gene. I think one good way to think about it is if you imagine a broken down car, so it, it's, you can definitely still tell that it, it used to be a car. It has all of the parts of a car like wheels and the body headlights and things, wheel. Um, and it's got the general shape of a car and everything. Um, but in, it just is not going to work anymore if you leave it out in your backyard and you cease to take care of it. And that's actually what happens with pseudogenes too. Um, once they stop being functional and once they stop uh, being used actively in the body, pseudogenes will rapidly accumulate more and more mutations. So it's kind of like the way where you need to constantly be giving your car upkeep. You know, you need to do oil changes, you need to uh, change the tires once in a while, things like that. Uh, the analogy in the genetic world for that is the fact that mutations are popping up all the time in your genes just naturally, but you have mechanisms to repair those mutations or to select against them. Um, if the gene is necessary and important for your survival. But once you're no longer using a gene, like in a pseudogene, there's no longer any selective pressure to maintain that gene in, uh, in good working condition. So it's like the car that you abandon in your backyard. You're not going to be fixing the windows when they break. You're not going to you know, keep the engine running. Once you've kind of given up on the car, it can accumulate all of this other damage and it'll um, just 
because it's, it has ceased being functional. So that's, that was the story of pseudogenes. And the existence of pseudogenes is one really, uh, it's a tough problem for creationists and intelligent design advocates because they don't really have a very good explanation for why they would exist. But let's move on to the second story, which is about parasites. So parasitism, as you may know, it's a, it's a non-mutual relationship between two species where one of the species is kind of benefiting at the expense of the other species. So the, the parasite is the one who is benefiting from the host. So parasites are generally much smaller than their host because they need to fit inside of them. Um, they're usually quite specialized because they often only can survive in uh, a handful or only even one specific host. Um, they are harmful to the host. It's, it's never good for you to have a parasite generally speaking. Um, and the, the, the parasites are also totally dependent on their hosts in order for them to survive. Um, being a parasite has certain advantages, of course, for the parasite, uh, where if you were you know, any kind of other organism, you would need to go out on your own to find food and to um, find shelter to be protected from the environment and things like that. You need to figure out ways to escape predators. But if you're a parasite and you're living inside a host, you just let that host do all the work for you. So uh, that's the way parasites work. Uh, a good example of a parasite is uh, this guy's uh, tapeworm. Um, there's a few different kinds of species of tapeworms, but they generally live within the digestive tract of humans. They just you know, latch onto your intestines and uh, leach nutrients and food off of you. You can, uh, you can get them from um, uh, things like undercooked meats, for example. So my second story is about a very special kind of parasite. So now that you know a, a little bit more about molecular biology, I want you to think about what could possibly exist to be a certain kind of parasite on a cellular level. You're jumping the gun. <laughs> but you're right. So uh, something like a cellular parasite would have to be you know, smaller than the cell. It would be, have to be specialized enough to figure out ways to get into your cells. Um, you know, if it's going to be a parasite, it's going to be harm for you, harmful to you. And it's going to be totally dependent on you to exist. Um, uh, and in this case, you know, with the analogy to a, a bigger parasite, as I mentioned, bigger parasites, they don't need to go out on their own and forage for food and things like that. Well, a, a cellular parasite, if it could live inside your own cell, it could have uh, a very simple genome, right? Because it could just rely on you to do all of the hard work of producing energy and producing proteins. Um, things like that. It could just use your tools to do those things if it was going to be a parasite of one of your cells. So does such a devious molecular parasite exist? Yes, it does. And that, of course, I'm talking about viruses. So viruses have their own genome. Looks like this. And they're very simple um, the way they uh, the only things they generally have are uh, a genome, which is you know, wrapped by proteins, and it's covered in a, some kind of shell, which is also made up of proteins. So it on, the only things that are within viruses are just proteins and <coughs> DNA or RNA. And the way that they actually work is by inserting themselves into your cells, or inserting themselves into your cells, and they actually hijack all of the molecular machines that you have in your cells. So the polymerases that you make, you know, RNA copies from DNA, they can steal those and use those. They will steal your ribosomes and hijack your own ribosomes in your cell to make the viral proteins. So uh, they're pretty evil little creations. So uh, viruses, they're also not considered to be living. 
because uh, they have you know, only protein in genetic material. They can't survive on their own. They are totally dependent on other cells to exist. So they're not really alive in any sense since they're uh, completely unable to, to survive on their own. But uh, so what that means is that you know, viruses are actually kind of like DNA sequences that have just totally gone wild. They're just totally out of control. Uh, you know, you've, you've probably heard terms like selfish genes. Well, viruses doesn't get any more selfish than that. It's just a piece of DNA or RNA which exists purely to make a lot of copies of itself. And uh, it has just, you know, completely devious ways to insert itself and sneak into your own cells and to use your machinery against you to make copies of itself. So here's another thought experiment. In 1912, there was an especially uh, virulent strain of flu. And uh, this 1912 flu virus ended up killing uh, millions of people around the world in a, a truly horrible epidemic. But using the tools of molecular biology, we could easily obtain the DNA sequence of this virus. And in fact, we have done that. Um, what some scientists did was dug up corpses of people who died from this epidemic, and there was still enough intact viruses present in their lungs that they were able to sequence the virus in a, in a uh, under, try, well, in, in order to try and understand it better. And uh, it was actually a very controversial publication. People thought that uh, this information is just too dangerous for anyone to know. But what if I took that sequence and using tools of molecular biology that I know, it would actually be pretty trivial to remake this virus and re recreate it, bring it back to Earth, and uh, maybe I could take it to a shopping mall and release it there. I'd probably kill a lot of people that way. And what would you think of me if I did something like that? What kind of person would purposefully recreate a virus with the intent of distributing it and killing a lot of people, uh, you'd probably say I was crazy. You'd probably call me a mad scientist or a psychopath, a, a murderer. You would say that it was a horrible crime against humanity, and you'd try to put me in jail for the rest of my life, rightfully so. And if I did something like that, I would probably be one of the most evil people ever in the history of the planet if I did this. Wouldn't you agree? So keep that thought in mind. Keep that anger. Keep that disgust about what this entails. And think about, what does that say about the God who created all of these viruses in the first place? <laughs> this is a list of 60 different viruses that infect humans. Just picked my top 60. There's a lot more than this. <laughs> what does that say about uh, an intelligent designer god who not only created that 1912 flu virus, but also smallpox and diphtheria and, and all of these other horrible viruses that have been a scourge of humanity? Uh, I don't think I would call that a loving god. So uh, one thing I should mention is that you, you shouldn't get the impression that these viruses are, are all pretty much the same. They're not really, they're not, don't think of them as just variations on the same theme. There's actually a lot of different kinds of viruses. I mentioned that viruses, they can have DNA genomes or they can have RNA genomes. They can have genomes that are single-stranded, uh, single-stranded DNA or single-stranded RNA, or they can be double-stranded genomes. The protein shell that coats viruses, a lot of different variety there. They can be spherical shells. They can form uh, helixes. They can form uh, icosahedrons and other different shapes like that. So really, the, the amount of creativity and ingenuity that the intelligent designer put into designing all of these different viruses is it's truly breathtaking. 
And I, I especially appreciate the way that this intelligent designer, if, if one exists, I really like the way that the designer made hepatitis and then thought that one version wasn't enough, <laughs> so they made four different other kinds of hepatitis. What I'm getting at is that I get kind of annoyed when intelligent design advocates sing the praises of things like the bacterial flagella and the eye and uh, the immune system and how amazingly designed all of those are and how beautiful creationists think rainbows and butterflies and puppies are. Uh, but if you're going to give God credit for all of those cool things, God also needs to take responsibility for all of these viruses. Uh, another thing to mention about this page, there's one special virus on here. Uh, you can perhaps predict which one it is. Variola, also called smallpox. It's the only virus on this list that has been eradicated from the surface of Earth. Scientists cured that one. Uh, it might still exist in a few uh, highly secretive and well-protected labs in Atlanta and maybe somewhere in Russia, but uh, for the most part, Smallpox is no longer a virus that is killing humans. And for that, we can give a hearty thank you to scientists who dedicated their life to eradicating it. So that's, uh, if you're keeping score, that's about you know, one for science and negative 60 for God. <laughs> I also wanted to do a little experiment, just as an aside. Um, what I would like, and it involves you guys, so there's some audience participation. So there's a few viruses also on here that I think are interesting, and those are measles, uh, mumps, and rubella. So what I want you to do is, if you're under the age of 30, I want you to raise your hand if you or anyone you know from your age group uh, has ever gotten measles, mumps, or rubella. Anyone under 30 who has gotten one of those? OK. One, I see one, one hand went up. OK, here's a follow-up experiment. If you are over the age of 30, I want you to raise your hand if you or anyone you know from approximately your age group has ever gotten sick with measles, mumps, or rubella. Ah. Interesting. And I want you to keep that little experiment in mind the next time someone tries to argue with you about vaccinations. Because we also have scientists to thank for that. The MMR vaccine was developed in the 1970s. And now people like me, people from my age group, uh, we've never, some of us have probably never even heard of measles, mumps, or rubella. We've never gotten sick with it. I don't know anyone who's gotten those, uh, been sick with those viruses. And the reason that is, is because of vaccination. That's why we are not getting them anymore. Another virus to mention, just a shout out to polio. That's another one where <laughs> We're on the way of eradicating that one, too. People like the, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, they're working on vaccine campaigns to eradicate polio from the planet also. So maybe within another decade or so, we'll, we'll have erased this one from the list, too. Praise be to science. <laughs> so back, back to evolution. Uh, what, do, what does my little story about viruses have to do with evolution? Well, there's a certain kind of virus which uh, works in a, a special way. So the virus, you can see it up here, it's binding to your cells, uh, kind of merging with your cell membrane. Then the viral, um, it's actually viral RNA, makes its way into your nucleus. And the RNA genome makes a copy of itself into a DNA form. So that's you know, the opposite direction of the central dogma. You've got RNA going to DNA. It uses an enzyme called reverse transcriptase to do that. Pretty cool enzyme. So that uh, viral DNA then integrates itself into, your, into the chromosomes uh, that exist in the, in the nuclei of your cells. Uh, so you know, generally, when that happens, those cells, are, they either die or your immune system kills them off. But uh, very, very rarely. Uh, every once in a while throughout the course of evolution, um, viruses have found their way and integrated into germline cells. And by germline cells, we mean things, you know, sperm and eggs. And if a virus 
it makes its way into one of those kinds of cells, you'll actually be able to pass on that virus to your progeny. Um, so that, I mean, that in itself is an extremely rare event for that to occur in a germline cell. Uh, and it's also an extremely, extremely rare event for uh, a virus to find its way into the germline and to be propagated throughout the course of evolution, but it, it has happened. And when that happens, you end up with something which is called an endogenous retrovirus, or ERV. So what I was describing was a they're called retroviruses because of reverse transcriptase, but ERVs are uh, endogenous, which means they've made, your way, made their way into the human genome. Um, so keep in mind the way that works. If, if a virus finds its way into a germline cell and it's passed on to your progeny, um, you know, humans start off as a single cell, so, and everything goes from there. So if, if this virus had started off in that single you know, the fusion of egg and sperm, then every subsequent cell is going to have that same virus integrated in the same place. Uh, so that, that's what an endogenous retrovirus is. It's, it's found its way and it's integrated itself into your genome. So to uh, borrow a, a quote from Daryl Ray, uh, about 8% of your genome is made up of endogenous retroviruses, and that's pretty fucked up. I bet you didn't know that, that 8% of your genome is viruses, viral DNA we're talking about in your genome, 8% of it. That, uh, it seems hard to believe, but it's actually true. Um, so those, uh, just to be clear, those are uh, inactive retroviruses, so they don't, they don't make active uh, infectious copies of themselves. Um, they're kind of just stuck there like a fossil, like a fossilized virus in your own genomes. The interesting thing is that sometimes they are functional. There's one <clears throat> well-known example of a uh, retroviral protein, which is actually, uh, we use that protein in the placenta. So that's a very rare example of a, a viral protein that humans, are, well, so our ancestors, uh, domesticated that viral protein such that we now use it for our own purposes uh, during gestation. Pretty interesting story. And uh, so human DNA is just absolutely riddled with these endogenous retroviruses all over the place. Uh, one estimate I found was something like 89,000 ERV elements spread throughout your genome. Uh, about another 40 or so percent of your, your genome is uh, other kinds of junk DNA. I uh, don't really have time to go into those. Uh, they're, uh, they're uh, basically just highly repetitive stretches of DNA, which you know, don't code for genes. Uh, the, the portion of your genome that actually uh, is, uh, codes for a functional gene is, a very, is actually a very small percentage, maybe like 2 or 3%. Um, a lot of the rest of it is, uh, appears to be junk DNA. Um, now, there's a lot of controversy with that term. Um, some we're, we're discovering now that some things that we thought were junk DNA, maybe it's not really junk, maybe we just don't fully understand it yet. But whether or not it's functional or not is kind of irrelevant to, to this point, which is when you look at the human genome, the impression that you get is not something which is the pinnacle of intelligent design that something like a creator god would have come up with. Um, you've probably heard the joke that a camel is what a horse looks like if it was designed by a committee. Well, you know, the human genome definitely looks like it was designed by a committee. It's, it's a real mess. And uh, it, it's, it certainly doesn't seem to me that uh, it could have been intelligently designed. Uh, so given that 8% of your genome is made up of viruses, that uh, leads to an interesting question. By the way, this is the philosopher, the philosopher raptor. He's a raptor who asks philosophical, philosophical questions for those who didn't know. But if we were made in God's image, is God also made of viruses? <laughs> All right, so now we are on to my last story, which is, I think, probably the single most convincing evidence for evolution 
uh, that has come out from molecular biology. So what you're looking at here, it, it's called the cladogram. So you have just different branches of the tree of life that are divided based on uh, the characteristics of them. So you know, you could group the plants over here, group bacteria over there, then here's the animals. Some of them are mammals, some are, you know, some are vertebrates, some aren't, some are arthropods. And uh, w when you make a cladogram, you're basically, you're, you're drawing a tree of uh, assumed relations just based on uh, the structural features that you're noticing within these species. But a, a cladogram is it's very qualitative. So in a cladogram, the lengths of these lines don't really mean anything. They're just, uh, you know, you can draw them to make the, whatever shape you want to. But with molecular biology, we can do one step better than that. And uh, we can create something called a phylogenetic tree, which where we do a genetic analysis. So we're not just looking at the, uh, you know, higher level structural free features of these animals. We can look at their genomes, compare those genomes, and get a lot better understanding of the relationships between them. So here's a few pictures of some of, uh, just some of the um, different kinds of life on Earth that we've sequenced. So by sequenced, I mean we, we've completely um, uh, read every single base pair from the genomes of all of these organisms. So I, I decided to do an experiment with uh, using these, I think it's 18 different species, and I wanted to, uh, to look at them and look at a, a gene within them and uh, try, to do a, try and do a phylogenetic analysis. So as far as I know, no one has ever done this before. I didn't know that it, was work, that it would work when I was going into it, but I think you'll be pretty pleased with the results. So the gene that I chose is called glyceraldehyde-3-phosphate dehydrogenase. Um, so it's kind of a mouthful, but this is a pathway called glycolysis. So you start with glucose, and it's uh, about an eight-step pathway where you're breaking down glucose. Uh, it starts out as you know, a six a ring of six carbons, it's a six carbon sugar. Eventually you, you split it in half, so there's three carbons. You do a bunch of molecular rearrange, rearrangements, blah, blah, blah. At the end, you end up with pyruvate. Uh, pyruvate is the end molecule of glycolysis. Pyruvate moves on to the citric acid cycle, for those who are interested. But glycolysis, uh, one of the enzymes within this step, w within this pathway is called, again, glyceraldehyde phosphate dehyd dehydrogenase. And uh, I chose this one because, uh, well, it's first of all, it's in glycolysis, and all life, pretty much all life on Earth uses this pathway. So I knew that when I was going to look at these different genomes that I would be able to find this gene, first of all. Um, and also, uh, I just know uh, that it's an important gene in glycolysis, so I thought it would be interesting to look at. So what I did was I used a resource called GeneBank, which is an online database which has every single gene that has ever been sequenced or discovered anywhere in science. Uh, you know, it's one of the greatest pinnacles of human achievement is to create this gene bank where all of our knowledge about different genes is stored and anyone can access it. Uh, I guess if you have the university credentials anyway. But so I looked up the sequence of this glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase gene from two different species here. Uh, on, on this slide, I'm comparing it from humans uh, to cows. And here, we're looking at the amino acid sequence, by the way. So you can find the nucleotide sequence, the, you know, the DNA sequence of the gene. But this is the final product. This is the amino acid sequence, which makes up the protein. So uh, you can just take a minute and see if you think that these two proteins are, are similar or not. Or not. Or uh, can you find any differences, maybe? Well, it's, it's actually uh, pretty hard to do it by eye, but see what happens when I move it around for you. Now does it uh, become a little bit clearer? You can probably see, um, you know, I've slid the two sequences right on top of each other. So wherever you see normal looking letters, those are amino acids that are exactly the same between humans and cows. And 
wherever you see these, you know, these weird things which look like two letters overlapping, those are uh, amino acids that differ in that position between these two species. And here I'm highlighting those differences in red uh, just to make it a little bit easier to see. Um, and as you can notice, there's a total of 19 different amino acid substitutions. So 19 amino acids are different for this GAPDH gene between humans and cows. Uh, maybe that in itself is already a little surprising to you that humans and cows are so similar um, at the genetic level, uh, at least for, for this gene. Here, let's look at another species that I, I, looked, to see, I looked up the sequence for this. Um, this is what the sheep version of this gene looks like. And it also has a total of 19 different amino acid substitutions that uh, differ in these highlighted positions um, when compared to humans. So they both have 19 different amino acids that are not the same as humans. But what's interesting is I'm going to flip back and forth between the sheep and the cow sequence. And hopefully what you can see is that even though both sheep and cows differ in 19 amino acids from humans, they actually share, uh, they, they have the same substitutions in most of these positions. So as I flip back and forth, you'll see that there's only two amino acids that differ between cows and sheep. Sheep. Okay, so if I were to ask you to draw what you thought the genetic or evolutionary relationship for these three animals would look like, I think you'd be pretty tempted to draw a phylogenetic tree something like this. Because sheep and cows, there's only two amino acids different between their two copies of this gene, but between uh, cows and sheep and humans, there's 19 differences. So just based on that, just based purely on that, we can infer that sheep, uh, sheep and cows, well, they probably have, they probably share a common ancestor um, uh, more closely together than, uh, than, hum than with humans. And uh, so this is, this is what a phylogenetic tree actually does, is it incorporates um, sequences and uh, it you'll look at the degree to which sequences uh, agree with each other or differ with each other. And uh, the extent to which they are the same is telling you something about our evolutionary history. Um, this is actually called the, you know, the molecular clock hypothesis, just based on looking at how many mutations or how many, how many differences there are between the proteins that you have and the proteins that other species have you can get a pretty good approximation of how distantly related you are to them. Um, so what I did is, you know, I have the sequences from all of these uh, 18 different species over here. And I use a program called Megaline, but there you could use a lot of different ones. Um, and what this program actually does is similar to what you were doing when you were trying to compare those two sequences, sequences that were uh, overlapping with each other. Um, but uh, the computer program does it for you. It actually uses matrix algebra to uh, uh, line up those two sequences at every possible different position and try to find the one that has the least number of discrepancies between them. And if you do that uh, over and over again, you will start to construct a phylogenetic tree. Um, so let's see what that actually looks like. These are the results of my little experiment. Again, I didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, I didn't look this up. I didn't cherry pick. Um, but I was able to produce this phylogenetic tree um, using this program just based purely on the sequences of one gene that's present in all of these organisms. So uh, let's look at um, what's actually going on uh, within this phylogenetic tree. So maybe you learned in high school biology, uh, King Philip came over from 
Greenland stoned is one way to remember it. Um, <laughs> these are the different uh, hierarchies of uh, describing taxonomy of different species. So uh, it starts at kingdom, kingdom at the top, kingdom is the most broad. And as you go down, you get more and more specific to where you're finally just getting to the species level, which is as specific as uh, we get. So from the kingdom level, you can immediately see that there's three main branches. Bacteria are down here, all off on their own. Plants, they have their own branch. And then everything up above that, uh, those are in the animal kingdom. What about at the phylum level? Uh, well, within animals, two uh, main, uh, well, two giant branches between uh, different kinds of animals are those that have a central nervous cord and those that don't. So chordata are animals that do have it, and arthropods are ones that don't. So all of the insects, they branch off on their own little uh, section of the tree down here. And the, the uh, chordata, or chordate, they are everything up at the top. What about on the class level? Well, there's the insect class. Uh, you can see amphibians are their own class. They branch off on their own. The actinopterygii, don't know if I'm saying that right, those are bony fishes. So uh, within these uh, different kinds of animals, you can break them up into fishes or fish. So that's a zebrafish and that's a salmon. Uh, you can break them up into birds, chickens, and sparrows. And you have another branch for mammals. Uh, up here in the mammal portion of the tree, you can break it down further into carnivores like dogs and cats. Uh, Arteriodactyla, uh, which are uh, animals that have hooves, uh, and primates, uh, us and chimpanzees. So this is, uh, I think this is really the most convincing uh, evidence that you could possibly ever find for evolution, that just based purely on looking at a DNA sequence, we are able to completely replicate the same phylogenetic tree that you would, you would also have produced using any other number of methods that people use to construct them. So you could look at embryology, or you could look at the fossil record, you could look at comparative anatomy. And uh, you know, those were all methods that we used in the past in order to construct these trees. Um, but now we can use genetics, which is going to be more accurate and more dependable. And we produce the exact same trees that we would have expected to produce. Um, uh, and this is, this is why evolution is such a strong theory, is that we have these totally new branches of science um, you know, that were totally not understood, totally unknown in Darwin's time. So you know, genetics, biochemistry, genomics, uh, molecular biology, cell biology, none of that was around when Darwin was alive. And uh, as we developed these new areas of science, um, we were able to test the theory, the, th the theory of evolution in completely novel ways. And, and that's really the strength, uh, the, the sign of a strong theory is uh, a theory that stands up in the face of new evidence and, and of new ways of testing it. Uh, and I don't think there's any other theory on Earth that has stood the test of time quite as well as evolution has. Um, So just to review the three, uh, the three different stories that we talked about. So uh, remember the phosphogluconate oxidase enzyme? All right, is this on? Can you hear me? OK. I'll just finish with this. I'm almost done. So yeah, remember that, uh, that pseudogene that uh, makes it so that we can't produce our own vitamin C. Uh, creationists need to figure out a way to explain why God gave us these pseudogenes, why God gave us these broken genes. And also, why did God give them to us in a way that is so suggestive of evolution? Why is it that uh, us and our most closely related primates also have this same, the same mutations that lead to the same pseudogenes.
uh, what about the story of the special kind of parasites? So those endogenous retroviruses that make up 8% of our genome. Uh, if there was an intelligent designer, why would our genome be made up with uh, so many viruses? And also I didn't mention, but it's also true that you can trace the evolutionary relationships of endogenous retroviruses also. So the uh, ERVs that we have, uh, primates also have the same ERVs in the same locations. So creationists need to explain why God made so much of our genome up of viral DNA and why he arranged it in such a way that is so similar for our, uh, that's traceable throughout evolution. And finally, the most convincing evidence that we talked about, why is it that when you look up any gene sequence, why is it that you can construct a phylogenetic tree based purely on the sequence of that gene and that tree will exactly replicate the, uh, the other trees of life that you would expect? Uh, you know, so how, how does an intelligent designer really explain it? Uh, well, you know, like I mentioned, uh, creationists, they believe that no matter what you observe, that's just the way that the designer or God, the creator, created it. There's no rhyme or reason at all behind any of the creation. It's just that's the way that he or she decided, decided to do it. But what's really worse, you know, the worst thing about this idea is that uh, it's not only that they have these uh, broken, you know, non-functional pieces of DNA and things like that, but also that they are um, heritable in, a such, in such a way to look as if we inherit them through common ancestry. Uh, we have genomes which, if they are designed, they're designed in such a way to look as if they had evolved. Um, so, you know, in, in each of these stories, all of the evidence that we're looking at points to one direction, okay? It points to evolution. Uh, and the reason for that, of course, is because evolution is true. And uh, as the scientist uh, Dobchansky said, uh, uh, everything, or well, really nothing in, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. So none of these stories really make sense to me unless evolution is true. Then they make perfect sense. I want to conclude with a few words of wisdom from a guy named Ken Miller. Uh, Ken Miller is probably one of the most uh, well-known and valuable defenders of evolution in the public. He testified at the Dover case, if you're familiar with that. He's got some great YouTube videos you should look up sometime. Uh, there's other stories uh, that he talks about that I didn't get a chance to mention. Uh, and the interesting thing about Ken Miller is that he's also a Roman Catholic. So here's a great, a great quote from him. Uh, he said that, you know, he's a Catholic. He believes in uh, a designer, uh, some kind of creator God. But what he doesn't believe in is a deceptive one. He doesn't believe in the type of God that would try and create things that are, are designed to try and fool us. And uh, I think he's right on about that. Even though we might not share the same religious views, I think uh, people like us, and people like Ken Miller can really join hands and try to increase the public understanding of science. If you ask me, Ken Miller's a pretty cool dude. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, and thank you all for coming. Uh, we spent a lot of time organizing this conference, and it takes a lot of effort, so it's really rewarding to see all of you guys come out here. It's the best part. Um, so I'm going to be talking about molecular biology and the way that this new field of science has informed our understanding of the theory of evolution and also how that applies to God and the God question. But just to make things clear, 
my talk is going to be about 75% really hardcore, solid, good science, and about 25% really lowbrow humor, internet memes, <laughs> mockery of religion. So just so you know what you're in for. So I wanted to start by talking about a few of the different um, lines of evidence that we think about when, uh, when, when we're understanding the theory of evolution. And one of the main ones is paleontology, which is, of course, you know, the study of prehist prehistoric life on Earth within the fossil record. And when you look at the fossil record, you see some pretty interesting things. Um, for example, if you look at different rock strata from anywhere in the world, um, you can see that there's different layers. And these layers tend to be very, uh, pretty well defined, and they exist everywhere around the world. doesn't really matter where you dig. And the interesting thing is as you dig deeper, you get uh, further and further away from animals that you would recognize today. So the younger layers at the top of the fossil record are more similar to things that are alive today. Things at the bottom, no one was really sure how traits were passed on from one generation to the next. They had no concept of DNA or of genes at all. Um, Darwin was a contemporary of the Austrian monk, uh, Gregor Mendel, and he was really the first one to do experiments with genetics uh, involving pea plants. And he was a contemporary of Darwin, but uh, he, his science and his work wasn't really appreciated in that era. We only rediscovered it long after his death. So uh, Darwin really had no idea how this kind of thing worked. And uh, he actually recognized that that was a, a weakness of his theory, was he uh, didn't know how traits could be passed on in order for natural selection to work. But um, now with the advent of molecular biology, um, we now know that the theory of evolution is really absolutely undeniable and there's no room for debate anymore. And I'm going to tell you three different stories um, about uh, how these new fields are instructing us. But first I wanted to give you just a really brief intro into the fields of cellular and molecular biology. Those are my field, what I'm studying in my PhD program. I happen to think they're the most interesting areas of science on the planet, so you're in for a treat. Uh, <laughs> so in, the, in cellular biology, you can divide life mainly into two different kinds. Uh, there's the eukaryotes, which is uh, a human type cell, and prokaryotes. And uh, they have a few key differences that I can point out here. So you'll notice that eukaryotes have a nucleus. Prokaryotes just kind of have their DNA all jumbled up in their cytosol. Eukaryotes have a lot of structures that are missing from prokaryotes. Um, all of the membrane-bound organelles, they call them. So organelles are kind of like the organs in your body um, on a cellular level. They perform different functions. And uh, prokaryotes just completely lack all of those membrane-bound organelles. Um, but to just give you an idea of a sense of scale, the, a human cell, just your average everyday human cell, is about 20 micrometers uh, in diameter. So micro is 10 to the negative sixth meters. Um, a bacterial cell is going to be more like 2 micrometers uh, in length. So that's how much bigger uh, a single human cell is compared to a bacterial cell. But I find that people don't really have a good concept of how big uh, a, a micrometer actually is. So this humongous trunk in the back, it's about 50 or so micrometers uh, wide. And that's what a human hair looks like. So just to give you a, a better sense of scale. So what is DNA anyway? Uh, DNA is, of course, the genetic material that we all have in all of our cells. And it's actually made up of only four letters. Uh, A's, A's, T's, G's, and C's. I don't think I did that wrong. G's and C's. Um, and uh, one, of, one of the key concepts of DNA is that A's always bind with T's and G's always bind with C's. So that, uh, that principle of 
complementarity is what allows a DNA strand to wind up with itself. Um, so the human DNA is extremely long, and um, in order to package that within your cells, you have to do a lot of uh, wrapping up of the DNA. So this is what the strand looks like up here. You, uh, you can wrap around the DNA around these proteins called histones, wrap the histones around themselves, wrap that around itself, and you just keep coiling everything up, and eventually you get to the level of a chromosome. And um, just to give you an idea of how much wrapping actually needs to happen, uh, we know that the human genome is about 3 million base pairs long, and we know that base pairs thereby look less and less like anything you would be familiar with. Um, and the really interesting thing is that you never seem to find fossils that appear in the wrong strata. So the biologist J.B.S. Haldane, uh, he famously said that if we ever found an example of a rabbit fossil in the Precambrian rock structures, we would pretty much have to throw evolution out of the window because we simply wouldn't be able to explain that. And as it turns out, we never see any examples anywhere of fossils turning up in layers where they shouldn't be. So, for example, humans, you'll never find humanid fossils anywhere in the Jurassic or Triassic era. So, Flintstones, not a documentary. <laughs> Another piece of evidence that is very uh, instructive of evolution is bio uh, biogeography. So, what we mean by that is that if you look at different places around the Earth, um, you'll see that the species there tend to be grouped according to geography. So Australia is really the only place that you're going to find marsupials, for example. And you're only going to find giraffes and zebras and lions in Africa. So even though you have different regions that could exist along the same latitude or longitude lines, um, and even though, even though they might have the same environments, you see different species there. So uh, in Darwin's time, the, the only explanation for that was that God could have just arbitrarily chosen where to put all of these species. Um, but Darwin made some interesting observations which led him to a different idea. So when he was in South, Af uh, South America on his journey, he would notice things like fossils of giant sloths. And these fossils were of species that no longer exist. So that alone made him think about how, uh, you know, species on Earth, they're not set in stone, or well, they're not unchanging. <laughs> they are set in stone. <laughs> and uh, you see fossils in, uh, in, like in South America, and those fossils are similar to the species that are currently existing there today. So there used to be giant sloths, now there are normal-sized sloths. And that idea, the uh, clustering in time and space of fossils, um, that really uh, convinced Darwin uh, of that uh, species are changing gradually over time. And uh, Darwin also thought a lot about how geographical barriers can have a, a play a role in evolution. And a good example of that is famously Darwin's finches, which uh, uh, you know evolved from a common ancestor finch and branched off into different species based on the food sources that were available on different islands. A third good example for evolution is comparative anatomy. So when you look at a cat and a dolphin, a human and a bat, um, on the outside surface, these animals really don't look like they have a lot in common. Uh, they don't seem very similar on the outside, at least. But when you look at their bone structures, you notice uh, that they all have the same number of bones in the same arrangement. So the humerus of a human, which is this part of your arm, uh, that bone also exists in cats and whales and bats. And same thing with the phalanges. Uh, the sizes of the bones are different, but they're always in the same number and always in the same arrangements. And that is a very uh, suggestive evidence of our common ancestry. ancestry.
So those are just three of the, I would think, most convincing areas of evidence for evolution. There's a lot more I didn't mention, like embryology and other things. But uh, today, we know a lot more that Darwin had no idea about. So the fields of molecular and cellular biology and genetics, these things just didn't exist at all during Darwin's time. 